Avoiding the Worst How to Prevent a Moral Catastrophe by Tobias Bauman. Text to Speech Note See the PDF for Copyright Node and Table of Contents. Introduction Human history is full of moral catastrophes, centuries of slavery, devastating wars, oppressive tyrants, cruel genocides. The range of atrocities fills many books. In many cases, the actions and moral beliefs of the past were horrifying by today's standards. We like to think that we have put all that behind us, but we have not. While there has undoubtedly been some progress, wars and slavery are on a global perspective, definitely not things of the past. And just as past generations often failed to realize how wrong their actions were, we may fail to recognize a contemporary moral catastrophe due to the moral blind spots of our time. For instance, we raise and kill vast numbers of animals each year on factory farms and in slaughterhouses, often inflicting terrible suffering on them in the process. If we take the argument for animal rights seriously, as I believe we should, then this constitutes an ongoing moral catastrophe. Other writers have documented and analyzed these issues in depth, but what about the possibility of a future moral catastrophe? Could such tragedies potentially take place on an even larger scale? And what can we do now to prevent that from happening? These questions have not yet been explored in much depth, and my book aims to fill this gap. I approach this topic with the belief that we should use our limited resources to help others as effectively as possible. From this perspective, some of the most important questions concern the scale and the likelihood of future moral catastrophes. If human civilization will have advanced technology at its disposal without sufficient moral progress to use it responsibly, we risk causing unprecedented levels of suffering. Likewise, an expansion into space could increase the amount of suffering by many orders of magnitude. This astronomical scope is a strong reason to take the risk of worst-case outcomes seriously, even if the likelihood remains unclear. I revisit these themes throughout the book Many readers may feel a tension between such abstract thinking about future risks and the urgent desire to do something to prevent horrible suffering in the here and now. I feel this tension myself, and the drive to help immediately is laudable. At the same time, our drive to help should not prevent us from thinking critically about what is most impactful in the big picture. At least we should keep an open mind and explore the risk of a future moral catastrophe. Some readers might likewise find it unpleasant to think in depth about worst-case futures. It can be disturbing to think about scenarios that involve a lot of suffering, yet we cannot afford to ignore the risk of such catastrophic scenarios if we want to do as much good as possible. We must objectively consider the arguments and the available information, however worrisome they may be. Before I dive deeper I should clarify the values that underlie this book. A key principle is impartiality, suffering matters equally irrespective of who experiences it. In particular, I believe we should care about all sentient beings, including non-human animals. Similarly, I believe suffering matters equally regardless of when it is experienced. A future individual is no less and no more deserving of moral consideration than someone alive now. So the fact that a moral catastrophe takes place in the distant future does not reduce the urgency of preventing it, if we have the means to do so. I will assume that you broadly agree with these fundamental values, which form the starting point of the book. The book is divided into three parts. Part 1 lays the conceptual groundwork by introducing the notion of risks of astronomical suffering as risks, which forms the centerpiece of the book. I provide a definition to distinguish S risks from other bad future outcomes, outline different types of S risks, and give examples of how S risks could come about. In Part 2 of the book, I review arguments for and against prior teasing the reduction of S risks. I break this question down into three sub questions whether we should focus on the long term future, whether we should focus on averting suffering and whether we should focus on preventing worst-case outcomes. In addition, I discuss potential biases that might distort our thinking on these questions. In Part 3, I explore how we can best reduce S risks. I outline plausible interventions along with their advantages and their drawbacks. Finally, I conclude with a discussion of how to proceed in light of great uncertainty about the future. Part 1. What are S risks? Chapter 1. Technology and Astronomical Stakes Throughout human history, the emergence of new technologies has often had a transformative impact on society. We reap the fruits of technological progress every day. Our smartphones would seem like magic to people living just a century ago. But perhaps more importantly, we live longer than ever before we have managed to eradicate many diseases, and we are at least on average, vastly richer than past generations. Yet there is another side to the story. Technology also brought with it industrial warfare, the atomic bomb, and environmental disasters, while new technologies offer unprecedented opportunities, they also pose serious risks, especially when combined with insufficient moral progress. The risks are exacerbated when we consider non-human animals, 
Industrialization has increased the consumption of meat and other animal products. This has multiplied the number of animals who are raised and killed, usually in deplorable conditions on factory farms and in industrial slaughterhouses. And it is worth noting that this is not due to intentional malice after all. Most people do not approve of animal suffering. Instead, factory farming is mainly the result of economic incentives and technological feasibility, coupled with a lack of moral concern. Barring extinction or civilizational collapse, technological progress will likely continue and endow humanity with new capabilities. If such advances allow us to expand into space and colonize other planets, the stakes will become truly astronomical. It is conceivable that human civilization could eventually populate billions of galaxies. If Earth originating civilization develops advanced technology or spreads out into space, it is more important than ever that we use our new capabilities responsibly. We need to be mindful of the possibility that future technologies might, coupled with indifference, lead to a moral catastrophe of colossal proportions. With so much at stake, we must close the gap between our power and our wisdom. Section, the concept of S risks. In this book I consider the risk of a future that contains vast quantities of suffering. Such scenarios have been labeled risks of astronomical suffering, but for brevity I will mostly use the short form suffering risks or S risks. Formally, S risks have been defined as risks of events that bring about suffering in cosmically significant amounts, where significant means significant relative to expected future suffering. In less formal terms, S risks are scenarios that involve severe suffering on an astronomical scale, vastly exceeding all suffering that has existed on Earth so far. You can't imagine a future development akin to factory farming, but on an even more horrendous scale. Note that the concept of S risks is gradual rather than binary, that is, S risks can be more or less severe. Also worth noting is that the definition of S risks refers to absolute amounts of suffering rather than to the ratio of suffering to overall population size. So a scenario in which the population size is extremely large can count as an S risk even if only a small fraction of the population is affected, as long as the total amount of suffering is sufficiently high. Section, S risks, dystopia, and X risks. The concept of S risks is more specific than any scenario that is considered, very bad. For instance, climate change is not an S risk. While climate change causes a well-documented range of adverse effects, from wildfires to sea level rise, it need not result in astronomical quantities of suffering per se similarly. S. Risks should be distinguished from the related but less specific notion of dystopia. Both terms are about worst-case outcomes, but dystopia is a broad term that can refer to any hypothetical future society that is considered highly undesirable. Since vast quantities of suffering are surely highly undesirable, S. Risks can be viewed as a class of dystopian scenarios. However, not every dystopian scenario qualifies as an S. Risk. This is primarily because the definition of S risks involves an astronomical scale, whereas a dystopia might take place on a smaller scale. In addition the concept of S risks focuses on sheer suffering, whereas many commonly discussed dystopian scenarios for instance George Orwell's 1984, emphasize themes such as a tyrannical government, surveillance, or a loss of freedom, one may consider something a dystopia, but not an S risk even if the population does not suffer severely for example because of brainwashing or ubiquitous entertainment. This highlights the subjectiveness of what one considers dystopian, which is part of why I prefer the less ambiguous concept of S-risk. To avoid confusion, we also need to distinguish S-risks from the concept of existential risk. Existential risks, often abbreviated as X-risks, are defined as an adverse outcome that would either annihilate Earth-originating intelligent life or permanently and drastically curtail its potential. How do S-risks relate to X-risks? Both are about the long-term future of civilization and the possibility of affecting outcomes on an astronomical scale. But X risks are about humanity's potential while S risks are about outcomes that contain vast amounts of suffering. There is some overlap between the two concepts. For instance if a totalitarian dictator takes over the world, this might both curtail humanity's potential, X risk, and cause vast amounts of suffering S risk. Still, S risks are a distinct concept and not a subclass of X risks. It is conceivable to have astronomical amounts of suffering that neither led to extinction nor curtail humanity's potential. Some forms of suffering, especially ones that affect non-human beings, may even be economically useful to human civilization. So not all S risks are X risks. Section, S risks, artificial intelligence, and artificial sentience. I have mentioned the idea that new technologies can have a massive impact on society. But what are specific candidates of transformative future technologies? One common hypothesis is that advanced artificial intelligence AI is likely to be a crucial technology.
If we create systems that can surpass humans in terms of general intelligence, then this would, so the argument goes constitute a pivotal event in human history. In particular, advanced AI systems could cause us risks if their increasing capabilities are not managed in a prudent way and conversely, they hold the potential to prevent us risks from other sources. If advanced AI will be a pivotal technology we should perhaps analyze as risk primarily in the context of scenarios in which advanced AI will determine the future. This raises many complex questions, which I will discuss in more detail later, in Chapter 10. Of course the future of artificial intelligence is highly uncertain, and it is unclear how we can positively influence such scenarios. Given this uncertain, PIA will not focus exclusively on s risk caused by advanced AI. But we should keep the possibility in mind that increasingly powerful AI systems could play a crucial role in shaping the long-term future. A second way in which advanced AI might be relevant relates to artificial sentience rather than intelligence. Artificial entities may, so the argument goes, develop a capacity for subjective experience at some point. The range of conceivable forms of artificial sentience includes digital enhancements to human bodies, uploading of minds into so-called whole brain emulations, or sentient simulations taking place within a larger computer program. Consider this thought experiment. If you were to take a sentient biological brain and replace one neuron after another with a functionally equivalent computer chip, would it make the brain less sentient? Would the brain still be sentient once all of its biological neurons have been replaced? If not, at what point would it cease to be sentient? This raises various philosophical questions about the nature of consciousness. A detailed review is beyond the scope of this book but I would note that most theories tend to agree that artificial sentience is possible in principle. To be clear, we do not know whether sentient artificial minds will actually be instantiated. Perhaps technology will never evolve in that direction, even if artificial sentience is possible in principle. But if conscious artificial beings come into existence, their well-being matters morally. It would not be justifiable to disregard their interest and potential suffering merely because such beings are based on silicon rather than carbon. At the same time many forms of artificial beings will likely be very alien to us and therefore pose a unique challenge to our moral sentiments. Such disembodied minds may have no face body movements or screams to which we can relate. That makes it difficult to empathize with them on a visceral level. In addition, we do not yet have a reliable way to detect sentience, especially in systems that are fundamentally different from human brains. We might therefore fail to recognize sentience and suffering in such voiceless beings. For all these reasons, it seems likely that people will not care to a sufficient extent about the well-being of some forms of artificial minds, provided that such minds are created. The human record of cruelty towards other humans and towards non-human animals does not bode well for future artificial minds. This is particularly worrisome if large numbers of sentient artificial minds are created in the future. One reason this might happen is that artificial minds are likely to have significant advantages over biological minds, making them economically expedient. Also, just as one can mass-produce hardware and copy computer programs at will it is plausible that creating large numbers of artificial minds will be very easy. The combination of potentially vast numbers of sentient artificial minds and the foreseeable lack of empathy poses a serious s risk. In fact, these conditions look strikingly similar to those of factory farming, which is also characterized by economic expediency in combination with moral indifference towards non-human animals. Chapter 2. Types of s risk in this chapter, I turn to the question of how S-Risk could come about. This is a challenging question for many reasons. In general it is hard to imagine what developments in the distant future might look like. Scholars in the Middle Ages could hardly have anticipated the atomic bomb. Given this great uncertainty, the following examples of S-Risks are to be understood mostly as informed guesses for illustrative purposes, and not as a claim that these scenarios constitute the most likely S-Risks. All of these examples put together might still account for only a small fraction of s risk compared to currently unknown s risks going into detail on any specific scenario also carries a risk of availability bias the availability bias is the tendency to view an example that comes readily to mind as more representative than it really is this mental shortcut can be problematic if as seems plausible s risks are actually distributed over a broad range of possible sources and scenarios to counteract the availability bias I will briefly outline many possible scenarios, rather than going into detail on any specific one. Yet another challenge is the lack of clear feedback loops, especially if the scenarios in question have no comparable precedent in history. A conventional evidence-based approach is therefore not straightforwardly applicable. Given these challenges, it is most fruitful to explore many different types of S-risks. I will group the spectrum of possible scenarios into three categories, incidental S-risks, agential S-risks, and natural s risks incidental s risks 
Incidental as risks rise when efficient ways to achieve a certain goal creates a lot of suffering in the process, without anyone actively trying to cause suffering per se the agent or agents that cause the S. Risk are either indifferent to that suffering, or they would prefer a suffering-free alternative in theory, but are not willing to bear the necessary cost in practice. We can further divide incidental S risks into subcategories based on the underlying motivation. In one class of scenarios economic incentives and market forces cause large amounts of suffering because that suffering is a byproduct of high economic productivity. We have already encountered this in the case of factory farming. It just so happens that the most economically efficient way to satisfy the demand for cheap animal products entails miserable conditions for farmed animals. Future technology might enable similar dynamics but on a much larger scale. Another possibility involves suffering that is instrumental for information gain. Experiments on sentient creatures can be useful for scientific purposes, while causing serious harm to those experimented on. Again, future technology may enable such practices on a much larger scale. As discussed in the previous chapter, it may become possible to run a large number of simulations of artificial minds that are capable of suffering. And if there are instrumental reasons to run many such simulations, this could lead to vast amounts of suffering. For example, an advanced AI system might run many simulations to improve its knowledge of human psychology or in an attempt to predict what other agents will do in a certain situation. It is also conceivable that complex simulations will be used for entertainment purposes in the future, which could cause serious suffering if these simulations contain artificially sentient beings. Many people enjoy violent forms of entertainment, as evidenced by countless historical examples, from gladiator fights to public executions. Another case in point is the content of today's video games or movies. Such forms of entertainment are victimless as long as they are fictional, but in combination with sentient artificial minds, they could be a potential less risk. Agential less risks. The previous examples are situations in which an efficient solution to a problem happens to involve a lot of suffering as an unintentional byproduct. A different class of S risks, which I call agential less risks, arises when an agent actively and intentionally wants to cause harm. A simple example is sadism. A minority of future agents might, like some humans, derive pleasure from inflicting pain on others. This will hopefully be quite rare and such tendencies might be kept in check through social pressures or legal protections. Still, it is conceivable that new technological capabilities will multiply the potential harm caused by sadistic acts. Agential S risks might also arise when people harbor strong feelings of hatred towards others. One relevant factor is the human tendency to form tribal identities and divide the world into an in-group and an out-group. In extreme cases, such tribalism spirals into a desire to harm the other side as much as possible. History features many well-known examples of atrocities committed against those that belong to the wrong religion, ethnic group, or political ideology. Similar dynamics could unfold on an astronomical scale in the future. Another theme is retributivism, seeking vengeance for actual or perceived wrongdoing by others. A concrete example is excessive criminal punishment as evidenced by historical and contemporary penal systems that have inflicted extraordinarily cruel forms of punishment. These different themes can overlap or take place as part of an escalating conflict. For instance, large-scale warfare or terrorism involving advanced technology might amount to an S-risk. This is both because of the potential suffering of the combatants themselves and because extreme conflict tends to reinforce negative dynamics such as sadism, tribalism, and retributivism. War often brings out the worst in people. It is also conceivable that agents would, as part of an escalating conflict or war, make threats to deliberately bring about worst-case outcomes in an attempt to force the other side to yield. A key factor that exacerbates agential S risks is the presence of malevolent personality traits, like narcissism, psychopathy, or sadism in powerful individuals. A case in point is the great harm caused by totalitarian dictators like Hitler or Stalin in the 20th century. I will later return to a more detailed discussion of the concept of malevolence its scientific basis, and possible steps to prevent malevolent leaders. Natural S risks? The categories of incidental and agential S risks do not capture all possible scenarios. Suffering could also occur naturally without any powerful agents being involved. Consider, for instance, the suffering of animals living in nature. Wild animals are rarely at the forefront of our minds, but they actually constitute the vast majority of sentient beings on Earth. While many people tend to view nature as idyllic, the reality is that animals living in nature are subject to hunger injuries, conflicts, painful diseases, predation, and other serious harms. I will use the term natural S risks to refer to the possibility that such natural suffering takes place, or will take place in the future, on an astronomical scale. For instance, it would be a natural S risk if wild animal suffering were common on many planets, or if it eventually spreads throughout the cosmos, rather than remaining limited to Earth.
If human civilization were to spread wild animal suffering throughout the universe, for instance as part of the process of terraforming other planets, that would count as an incidental s risk. Text to speech note C diagram on page 18. I have so far bracketed the question of how likely or severe the different types of s risks are. This is partly because the distribution of expected future suffering is an open question that is subject to great uncertainty. Nevertheless natural s risks generally seem less worrisome than the other categories. The available evidence, such as the non-observation of any alien life forms, does not suggest that wild animal suffering or anything comparable is common in the universe. And there is also not much reason, as far as I can tell, to think that a new source of natural suffering of astronomical proportions will come into existence in the future. Section, Other Classifications The classification I have presented so far is based on the mechanisms through which astronomical future suffering might come about. Of course, this is not the only way to classify S risks. Another helpful category are or known and unknown S risks. A known S risk is a scenario that we can't already conceive of at this point. Yet our imagination is often limited. Unknown S risk may emerge in scenarios that we never thought of or cannot even comprehend akin to the atomic bomb from a medieval perspective. It is possible that unanticipated mechanisms will lead to large amounts of incidental suffering unknown incidental S risks that future agents will have unanticipated reasons to deliberately cause harm, unknown agential S risks, or that new insights reveal that, despite appearances, our universe contains astronomical amounts of natural suffering unknown natural s risks. We can also distinguish s risks by the type of sentient beings who are affected. There are s risks that affect humans s risks that affect non-human animals, and s risks that affect artificial minds. The examples I have discussed were primarily focused on the two latter categories. This is because s risks affecting non-humans are likely to be more neglected, although this does not mean that s risks that mainly affect humans are unimportant. Finally, it can be useful to distinguish between influenceable and non-influenceable S risks. An S risk is influenceable if it is possible in principle to do something to prevent it, even if this may be, for whatever reason, difficult in practice. For obvious reasons, I focus entirely on influenceable S risks, and all examples I discuss so far are influenceable. Non-influenceable astronomical suffering for instance in an unreachable part of our universe, is lamentable but not worth our attention or effort. Part 2 Should we focus on S risks? Section Introduction Among the myriad ways to do good why should reducing S risks be a main priority? You might think that many of the examples I have given seem far-fetched, or that the discussion of such future risks boils down to unfounded speculation, so why should we take this seriously? A common measure of the seriousness of a risk is its expected value EV. The EV is the product of the scope of a risk and its probability of occurrence. For example, suppose that disease A afflicts one individual. While disease B afflicts 20 individuals equally badly with a probability of 10%, and none otherwise. According to the principle of EV maximization we should all else equal priorities preventing disease B because its prevention has a higher EV 20 individuals 10% probability equals to afflicted individuals and expectation, rather than one. The scope of S risks is, by definition, astronomical. It is difficult to intuitively grasp the staggering scale of cosmic outcomes. Compared to present-day sources of suffering like factory farming or wild animal suffering, S risks are not just twice as large or even 10 times as large. Instead they are larger by a factor of thousands or millions, perhaps even billions. Thus, unless the probability of occurrence is vanishingly small, the expected value of S risks is enormous. To avoid that conclusion, one would need to be extremely confident that S risk will not happen. I will discuss reasons for optimism and pessimism about the likelihood of S risks in detail later. For purposes of this simple argument it suffices to note that one can hardly justify an extremely low probability. To give a specific number I claim that the probability of an S risk materializing is not less than 1 in 1000, in light of contemporary analogs like factory farming, and a range of plausible mechanisms for how S risks could come about. This lower bound and the vast scope of S risks suggest in the EV framework, that averting S risks should be a priority. Of course a simple analysis is not entirely satisfactory and we should dig deeper. I will break down the case for a focus on S risks into three underlying views. 1. Long-term focus. We should mostly focus on improving the long-term future, rather than primarily trying to help those alive now or in the near future too. Suffering focus. We should prioritize averting severe suffering relative to other goals such as creating a utopian future for humanity. This can be justified on moral or on empirical grounds. 3. Worst case focus. The most effective way to reduce expected suffering in the long term is to focus on preventing particularly bad outcomes that contain a lot of suffering. I will address each of these points in turn.
My goal is to provide an even-handed overview of the ideas that underpin a focus on S risks, as well as possible reasons to reject such a focus in favor of other priorities. It is worth noting that the endorsement of these views is gradual rather than binary. We should ask to what extent we believe in each of the underlying views, and to what extent we prioritize S risks as a result. Similarly, a person who only endorses two of the three above points may still be concerned about S risks to a significant degree. Chapter 3. Should we focus on the long-term future? Most people who want to improve the world tend to focus on helping individuals alive today. We more readily empathize with the suffering of those living now than those who will exist a thousand or a million years in the future. Yet what reasons do we have to discount the interests of future individuals merely because they live at a different time? It seems that the time at which someone exists is not relevant to their moral status. From an impartial perspective, the fact that we live in a certain time does not grant individuals living at this time any special ethical significance. So disregarding the suffering or other interests of an individual because of the time they live in would be akin to denying them equal moral status because of other contingent factors, such as the place they live in. This seems arbitrary. It can be said to be a type of discrimination, similar to disregard for those who do not share our skin color or gender, or for those who belong to a different species, but we should distinguish this notion of time impartiality that suffering matters equally regardless of when it is experienced, from the claim that long-term consequences of our actions should, in practice, guide our decisions. I will refer to this as a practical long-term focus. Time impartiality lends support to, but does not necessarily imply practical long-term focus. This is because the latter also depends on the number of beings in the future and the extent to which we are able to help them. I think the philosophical case for time impartiality is overwhelming so I will primarily discuss questions relating to the practical side. Section. The future could be vast. The main argument for a practical long-term focus is the potentially vast number of future beings. On cosmic timescales our lifetime is but an instant compared to the millions and billions of years to come. To give some numbers according to current cosmological models the universe is 13.8 billion years old and the remaining lifespan of the sun before it turns into a red giant is estimated at 5 billion years. The oldest fossil evidence of modern Homo sapiens dates to around 300,000 years ago, or 0.0003 billion years, so the individuals who are alive today, and who will live in the coming decades, are vastly outnumbered by those who will live in the centuries, millennia, and ages to come bracketing the possibility of imminent extinction. In addition to being long the future could be big in the sense of containing vast numbers of sentient individuals per generation. We have already encountered the idea that an expansion into space could raise the stakes, Space colonization could potentially multiply the number of sentient beings by many orders of magnitude. It is of course highly uncertain whether the future will be long, big, both, or neither. But the point still stands. Akin to the previous argument regarding the EV of S risks, we can hardly be certain that the future will be neither long nor big. And this is enough to establish that future beings vastly outnumber present-day beings in expectation. Given a moral view that urges us to help others as effectively as possible, this strongly suggests that we should focus on how our actions can benefit future beings. Section, influencing the long-term future is difficult. The most common argument against the practical long-term focus is the difficulty of influencing the distant future. The idea that we should optimize for long-term impact, rather than short or medium-term impact, only makes sense if we can actually do something now to reliably improve the long-term future unfortunately. Our impact on the distant future is less predictable than our shorter-term impact. We face great uncertainty over what the future will look like. The world is vast, our knowledge base is limited, and the lack of reliable feedback loops hampers a trial and error approach. This is not to say that further research is futile, in fact. I will later argue that research is one of the most important activities at this point. Another challenge is that most of what we can hope to affect now can, and likely will be changed by later decisions, and future decision makers may be in a better position to solve future problems than we are. For instance, future people will likely know better which S risks are most serious, which might give them the upper hand in fun. But this approach of punting to the future is risky. It might be too late to start thinking about S risks when they already start to materialize. Without sufficient foresight and caution, society may already be on a trajectory that ultimately leads to worst case outcome. And even if future actors are able to prevent S risks, it is not clear whether they will care enough to do so. Therefore, we can still do useful things now to ensure both sufficient ability and motivation to reduce S risks. For example, we can establish a field of research that future people can draw on. And we can foster a community of people who are interested in the topic. I will elaborate on why these interventions are promising in Chapter 11. The hurdles we face when attempting to improve the long-term future are significant, but not insurmountable.
It seems hard to argue that the endeavor is entirely futile. Proponents of the practical long-term focus could therefore argue that the challenges of influencing the long-term future do not counterbalance the vast number of future individuals. After all, future individuals outnumber present-day individuals by many orders of magnitude and expectation so even if great uncertainty reduces our ability to benefit beings in the distant future by 99%. Compared to our ability to help existing beings, the expected value framework may still favor focusing on the long-term future, because the scope is larger by more than a factor of 100. But the following argument can potentially counterbalance the vastness of the future. If the future is long or big, then the outcome is likely to be determined by the decisions of a vast number of individuals. Unless we are in a special situation, our influence might be diluted roughly in proportion to the number of future individuals. The longer and bigger the future, the higher the stakes, but the lower our influence on the long-term outcome. At first glance, these effects cancel each other out. This argument is abstract and simplistic but it reveals an interesting observation. The fact that the future could be long or big is not, in itself, sufficient to establish that we should focus on the long term. We should also ask whether we are in a unique position with a lot of leverage over the future. Section. Are we in a good position for long-term influence? Some scholars have discussed the hinge of history hypothesis, that is, the idea that events in this century will have a disproportionate influence on the long-term future. One reason is that a pivotal event could occur in the foreseeable future such as the aforementioned development of smarter-than-human eye. Such unusual events could lead to a lock-in of certain values and power structures, resulting in a steady state that determines everything that happens afterwards. This would avoid the dilution of our long-term impact, and thus endow our generation with unusual leverage over the long-term future. But what evidence can justify the extraordinary claim that we live at a pivotal time? We should be wary of narratives that feed our desire to be special in some way. If history is any guide, it seems more likely that the foreseeable future will entail a gradual, often chaotic evolution of values, institutions, power structures, and many other features, with no discernible endpoint. On the other hand, we do not need to fully endorse the hinge of history hypothesis to defend a practical long-term focus, and we do have grounds to think that our time has substantial leverage over the long-term future. The simplest reason for this is that we are early. The observation that we are still on a single planet, that could potentially originate a vast cosmic civilization suggests that we might indeed be in a unique position. If a long or big future happens, then almost all individuals will live in the future, which means that we can influence them but they cannot influence us. A less abstract argument is the high pace of technological progress, social change, and economic growth in the last centuries and in the present century. In fact, it is physically impossible for economic growth to continue at the current levels for more than a few thousand years. This lends support to the view that our time, as well as the preceding and following centuries, is particularly influential, although the relationship between economic growth and the degree of influence over the long-term future is complex. Section, Finding a Middle Ground This brief overview of relevant considerations has merely scratched the surface. All things considered, the case for primarily focusing on the long-term in our efforts to improve the world seems strong, and I will mostly adopt this view in the remainder of the book. Yet we must not forget about the terrible suffering that takes place in the here and now. We need to strike a balance between the urgency of reducing ongoing suffering and the goal of improving the long-term future. After all, these are not diametrically opposed aims. So the fact that future individuals vastly outnumber present-day individuals does not mean that we should disregard the latter altogether. A plausible middle ground is a focus on improving the state of civilization one or two centuries from now, which will also likely translate to better outcomes in the very long term. In particular, this means that we should seize low-cost opportunities to support efforts to alleviate ongoing suffering. A case in point is the previously mentioned issue of wild animal suffering. Since few people have worked on improving the welfare of animals living in nature, it is likely that there are still relatively easy and cheap ways to make progress, even if only by raising awareness and doing further research. Likewise, it is without doubt a worthy cause to end what is one of the largest moral catastrophes of our time the exploitation of non-human animals, and the billion-fold suffering it entails. I will discuss interventions to improve the long-term future in Part 3. I will also come back to the question of why and how animal advocacy can be helpful from a long-term perspective. Chapter 4 Should we focus on reducing suffering? To what degree should we prioritize the avoidance of severe suffering? The answer depends both on judgment calls in moral philosophy and on empirical beliefs regarding the expected quality and quantity of future lives. The ethical part is about how much weight we give to the reduction of suffering or other harms, compared to other goals.
The range of possible priorities for the long-term future includes ensuring human survival, creating additional happy lives, increasing the happiness of individuals that are already well off, and increasing the probability of a utopian future. This raises the thorny question of how much we value and prioritize these different goals, and how we can measure and compare suffering and happiness to begin with. The empirical part concerns our degree of optimism or pessimism about how much suffering the future contains and expectation. The more optimistic one's view of the future is, the more suffering focused one's moral view needs to be to prioritize s risk reduction. Conversely, if a large scale moral catastrophe appears likely to occur in the future, then a large range of moral views will assign great priority to mitigating such an outcome. Section Suffering Focused Ethics Proponents of suffering focused ethics argue that the reduction of suffering is of primary moral importance. It stands to reason that this family of moral views, in conjunction with a long term focus, tends to support a focus on s risks. There are many varieties of suffering focused ethics, which can be supported by many lines of argument. One class of views endorses an asymmetry in the moral importance of creating happy lives compared to preventing miserable lives. In this view, failing to create a happy life does not constitute a bad or a moral wrong on par with the creation of a miserable life. The sentiment is expressed in Jan Narvison's famous dictum We are in favor of making people happy, but neutral about making happy people. Another common view relates to the idea that, Severe suffering carries a unique moral urgency and a corresponding duty to help. By contrast, the mere absence of happiness or of other purported goods carries, so the argument goes, no such urgency. An example of an idea that can support this view is antifrustrationism, which says that we don't do any good by creating satisfied extra preferences, and that you can't do any better than having no frustration. Another idea is that happiness consists in tranquility or peace of mind. Or one could argue that pleasure is undisturbed affection or the absence of distress, irritation, pain, worry, and so on, and that pleasure cannot increase from that point. Another common theme is the unique badness of extreme suffering in particular. The worst forms of suffering are seen as much worse than the best states of happiness are good. Extreme suffering can therefore not be outweighed, or at least not easily according to this family of views. Of course, suffering focused views have also been the subject of criticism. Other value systems, Such as classical utilitarianism contend that creating independent positive goods, like happiness, is of comparable urgency and can morally outweigh or cancel out any amount of suffering. Depending on how large the required amount of positive goods is, such views might consider the realization of vast possibilities of a utopian future more important than s risk reduction. It is worth noting, though, that a focus on s risks need not be predicated on views according to which we should exclusively reduce suffering. After all, There is also a broad range of moderately suffering focused, or pluralistic views, and views that hold that severe suffering can readily be outweighed would usually still consider the reduction of s risk valuable even if it is not a top priority. A detailed review of the pertinent subfields of moral philosophy is beyond the scope of this book. For a more elaborate discussion, I refer the reader to Magnus Vinding's book Suffering Focused Ethics, Defense and Implications 2020, and Jamie Mayer Feltz's Suffering and Moral Responsibility 1999. Section s risks are not extremely unlikely. A key question on the empirical side is how likely s risks are. Those who are confident that the future will be bright will tend to give less weight to dystopian scenarios. A common argument for optimism is that future technology will render it easier to achieve desired outcomes without causing suffering. Since people care at least a tiny bit about avoiding suffering, existing levels of concern will likely be sufficient as soon as the costs of avoiding suffering become very small. An example of this dynamic could be meat that has grown in cell cultures. Without the need to raise or slaughter animals, such technologies might render animal farming obsolete in the future, and may thus prevent suffering without requiring everyone to care deeply about the plight of non human animals. While this argument has some merit, it is not airtight. For instance, it does not apply to agential s risks, which might be exacerbated by powerful technology combined with a relatively low level of concern for suffering. And given our great uncertainty about the future, such abstract arguments are in any case only a weak reason for optimism. A related argument refers to the empirical observation of positive trends over the last centuries, for instance, in terms of declining violence, improved health, and many other metrics. It is undoubtedly true that the world has improved in some ways, but this perspective still seems anthropocentric. When taking into account the rapid increase in the number of farmed animals since the Industrial Revolution, it is far less clear whether the world is getting better or worse over time. Human progress may have incidentally multiplied animal suffering. And the number of animals slaughtered is still rising. This is not to say that I endorse a highly pessimistic view of the future. Instead, the point is merely that a high level of confidence in an optimistic view is not warranted. And unfortunately, 
There are several reasons to believe that the probability of S risks is not vanishingly small. First, S risks can materialize in many ways, as discussed in Chapter 2. It is hard to predict the future, and we can only imagine a limited range of scenarios. So even if any particular scenario that we can conceive of seems highly unlikely the probability of some, perhaps unknown, S risk may still be non-negligible. Second, S risks may seem speculative at first, but the underlying assumptions are quite plausible. Barring globally destabilizing events, we have no reason to expect that technological progress will soon come to a halt. It is not speculative to argue that more powerful technology will raise the stakes, for better or worse. And it is also plausible that those in power will continue to show insufficient concern for the suffering of less powerful beings, akin to the current lack of concern for the suffering of non-human animals or disadvantaged humans. Third, historical precedents exist. It is tempting to see humanity on a path towards ever greater moral progress, but severe moral regress can also occur. A case in point is the rise of fascism in the 20th century, which was unimaginable to many contemporary observers. We also have a mixed track record regarding the responsible use of new technologies, from novel tools for brutal torture to chemical weapons and nuclear bombs. Likewise, the situation of non-human beings has worsened in many ways with the advent of factory farming, so we can hardly be certain that future technological developments will be handled with appropriate care and consideration. To clarify, working on S-Risk does not require a pessimistic view of the future. The above arguments are consistent with believing that technology can also benefit us, that we could use it to reduce rather than increase suffering, or that our quality of life may improve to unprecedented levels. To be concerned about S-Risks, it is sufficient to believe that the probability of a bad outcome is not negligible, which is consistent with believing that a utopian future is also quite possible. Section, a focus on suffering is at least a plausible perspective. Plausible ethical arguments and empirical considerations lend support to a focus on suffering. And while not all combinations of moral and empirical views consider the reduction of suffering the foremost priority in practice, it is uncontroversial that preventing or alleviating severe suffering is of great importance. Virtually everyone would agree that such suffering should, all else equal, be avoided. A focus on suffering is particularly widely accepted if conceived of as a strong component in a moral view, rather than being exhaustive. This is not to deny that there is profound disagreement. People have different priorities, and this will remain true in the foreseeable future. This is a reason to seek to foster cooperation between people who endorse different value systems. Instead of narrowly pursuing our own ethical aims and potential conflict with the aims of others, we have strong reason to seek common ground and to embrace projects that are valuable from many perspectives. Since avoiding vast amounts of suffering is a common interest of many value systems, S risk reduction is a good candidate for a shared aim that people with different values can agree on. Chapter 5 Should we focus on worst case outcomes? The combination of a long term focus and a sewering focus implies that we should work towards reducing future sewering. A focus on S risks entails the additional belief that guarding against particularly bad outcomes is an expectation the most active way to reduce future sewering. I will refer to this as a worst case focus. Without this belief, the concept of S risk might not add much value as it would be simpler to just talk about reducing future sewering. Consider a toy model with three possible futures, a future with no sewering, for instance due to improved moral standards or advanced technology that makes it possible to abolish sewering altogether, b a future that contains similar amounts of sewering as now, in which some people live in abject poverty, factory farms, or future equivalents thereof, continue to exist, and wild animal sewering is never tackled to a sufficient degree. See a future that contains significant levels of sewering on an astronomical scale, that is a future in which an S-risk materializes. The worst case focus rests on the claim that the deference between B and C is much greater than the deference between A and B, so that preventing C is most important, even taking into account a lower probability of C by contrast. A rejection of the worst case focus would imply a belief that most expected sewering lies in futures that are moderately bad, but not so bad as to qualify as S-risks. In this case, it might make more sense to increase the probability that sewering is abolished altogether. Section Is future sewering heavy tailed? Why should we believe that most expected sewering in the future stems from worst case outcomes? Many phenomena, from the size of earthquakes to the number of fatalities and wars, have been modeled using a power law distribution. The power law is an example of a heavy tailed distribution in which extreme outliers are common. In other words, most casualties of war are concentrated in a relatively small number of the bloodiest wars and most of the overall damage from earthquakes is due to the most extreme ones. This tentatively suggests that a similar pattern might hold for future sewering, that is that a large fraction of expected sewering might be concentrated in the most extremist risks. 
This is only weak evidence because it is not clear how comparable all these diorant phenomena are, and many other distributions are less heavy-tailed. Consider, for instance, the distribution of income in the United States. Income is highly unequal, and the top 1% of earners make far more than others. Yet they still make up less than percent of the total income. This is not to say that the existing degree of economic inequality is unproblematic, especially since wealth is more skewed than income. My point is merely that this is an example where the outliers do not completely dominate the distribution, or at least not as strongly as they do in the case of wars or earthquakes. A reason to think that S-risks are a heavy-tailed phenomenon is that the scale of future sewering could, as mentioned before, vary by many orders of magnitude, for instance, due to the vastness of a potential intergalactic civilization. This deerance of many orders of magnitude is difficult to grasp intuitively, as our minds did not evolve to deal with such large numbers. However, quantities like income or war casualties can also vary by many orders of magnitude. So, this is perhaps not unique to S risks. All things considered, a worst case focus seems at least plausible. Though it remains unclear to what degree we should expect future sewering to be concentrated in the most extreme outcomes, it is also important to keep in mind the gradual nature of the worst-case focus. While many real-world phenomena are somewhat heavy-tailed, they are almost never extremely skewed such that, say, the most extreme 0.1% account for 99% of the distribution. So we should perhaps focus on, say, the worst 10% of outcomes, rather than the worst 0.1%. Section Reasons to Avoid a Narrow Focus on Just a Few Scenarios it is important to distinguish the worst-case focus from the notion that we should concentrate on a small number of specific worst-case scenarios. I will refer to the law as a narrow focus. At our ST glance, the worst-case focus appears to imply such a narrow focus. But a heavy tail distribution does not necessarily mean that most, expected, future sewering would come from just a few specific sources. After all, the most extreme 1% of a distribution can still be very diverse. As a case in point, the richest 1% s percentile vary a lot in terms of how they acquired their wealth or in terms of their political attitudes. And they are also a large group in absolute terms, for example, 1% of the US adult population is still more than 2.5 million people. Similarly, the worst 1% of possible futures could include a substantial number of diverse scenarios and sources of sewering. A narrow focus is also risky because of great uncertainty. Even if most sewering occurs in a limited number of specific worst-case scenarios, we might still be mistaken in our best guesses as to what those scenarios are. Indeed, if our guesses rely on Lee Lee more than speculation, it seems very likely that the worst scenarios are among those to which we currently give Lee Lee weight. In light of great uncertainty, a narrow focus on a few specific scenarios seems suboptimal. Even if a small number of scenarios make up a large fraction of expected sewering, it could still be better on balance to address a broader range of risks. This is the case if more targeted interventions against the worst risks are not available are not significantly more active than broader interventions that are helpful with respect to a wider range of risks. It is worth noting though that the discussion above is about what people who are interested in reducing S risks should do as a collective. It can still make sense for individual people to specialize on a narrow set of scenarios, as long as our yurts to reduce S risks collectively cover a sufficiently broad set of risks. Finally, it would be misguided to only consider the negative tale of worst case outcomes that are caused by human civilization. In the case of natural S risks, or astronomical sewering caused by alien civilizations, a positive tale could arise from potential opportunities to prevent those S risks. The gear above illustrates how the impact distribution could be double tailed, or heavy tailed in both directions. It shows percentiles along the X axis, and the amount of sewering that is created are reduced by human civilization along the Y axis. The red part is the negative tail, sewering caused by human civilization, and the green part is the positive tail sewering averted by human civilization. As symbolized by the arrows, it would be beneficial to reduce the negative tail, and to increase the positive tail. For various reasons, such as the apparent emptiness of the universe, it seems plausible that the negative tail is larger. Still in light of great uncertainty, we should give some weight to both tails, as illustrated in the gear. This is yet another reason to prefer interventions that are robust across many scenarios. Chapter 6. Cognitive biases Modern research has documented that the human mind is prone to a long list of cognitive biases, systematic parns, of odd thinking or mental shortcuts that often cloud our judgment. In the following I will argue that common biases could cause us to mistakenly dismiss or downplay S risks. To form an accurate appraisal of S risks, we need to keep these biases in mind, and try to control for their distorting eat. Section Wishful thinking One of the most well-documented biases is wishful thinking, a tendency to believe what we wish were true rather than what is supported by the available evidence. 
wishful thinking is likely to be a significant source of bias against taking s risks seriously. We dream of a bright future, and the possibility of a vast moral catastrophe disturbs this dream. This bias is plausibly exacerbated by the unpleasantness of contemplating worst-case outcomes. Preventing s risks is not a particularly inspiring vision, unlike the prospect of a utopian future or opportunities to help others in the here and now. It can't even be emotionally taxing or depressing to devote one's attention to horrific sewering and worst-case futures, so we often prefer to turn a blind eye to other sewering and to risks of bad outcomes, especially when we ourselves are comfortable and safe. Psychological research has long documented this denial of atrocities sewering and other uncomfortable realities. Denial can't take many forms such as not wanting to know about sewering, denying that the sewering is real, downplaying its badness or disputing any personal responsibility on our part. Yet another related but distinct bias is the just world fallacy. We like to assume that the world is morally fair and just. If something bad happens to someone, they must have done something to deserve it. This thought is more comforting than is facing a reality that often contains entirely pointless horrific sewering. These psychological tendencies plausibly conspire to produce a bias against taking s risks seriously. To overcome this bias, we must actively resist the urge to avert our attention from the distressing possibility of astronomical sewering. There is too much at stake. Section Scope Neglect Scope Neglect refers to our inability to fully appreciate the scope of a problem. At the level of our moral cognition we simply do not feel the numbers. Abstract considerations about future sewering do not pull on our emotional heartstrings in the same way that a single identifiable victim does. We may consciously acknowledge that a large-scale moral catastrophe is much worse, but it seems impossible to truly grasp the badness in proportion to the scope. Scope neglect likely eats our reasoning about s risks. After all, an exceptionally vast scope is precisely the hallmark of s risks. Thus, to fully appreciate the vast scale of worst-case futures, we likely need to make a deliberate ear to counter scope neglect. A related eek is proportion dominance we feel more compelled to help 10 out of 10 individuals and to help 10 out of 1,000, even though the absolute impact is the same. This eek likely distorts our intuitions against the focus on alleviating sewering and worst-case outcomes, as we may wrongly, and be it more worthwhile to go from 10 instances of intense sewering to zero than to go from 1,000 to 990. In general few people have fully internalized the expected value framework in the context of altruism, even if they agree with it in theory. It is the cult for the human mind to conceive of or comprehend the magnitude and probabilities of s risks. Likewise, few people have fully internalized the idea that helping future sentient beings is just as important as helping those alive now, or the idea that species membership per se is an ethically irrelevant characteristic. It is thus unsurprising that the consistent application of these principles can result in conclusions that seem counterintuitive, such as prior teasing the prevention of worst-case scenarios. Yet if we are content that the underlying moral and decision-theoretical beliefs are sound, then it is reasonable to follow them to their conclusions. Section, Belief Digitization Belief Digitization is the tendency to implicitly assign hypotheses the probabilities of either one or zero, rather than accurately taking uncertainty into account. When making predictions or decisions, people tend to implicitly round down the probability of an unlikely hypothesis to zero even when they consciously agree that the hypothesis has non-negligible probability, Conversely, an apparently plausible hypothesis is often taken for granted that is implicitly assigned a probability of one, even when there is considerable uncertainty. This could mean that we may be prone to mistakenly dismiss s risks because we implicitly round our probability down to zero. This is at odds with valid reasoning about probabilities and expected values because a small but non-negligible probability can, as outlined earlier, still be enough to justify a focus on s risks. For reasons to believe that the probability is not very close to zero see chapter 4, apart from the question of whether to prioritize s risks, belief digitization can also lead us to focus on an overly narrow range of s risks. If we are implicitly too content in certain assumptions, because we round their probability up to one, we may be inclined to focus on too small a class of scenarios. This is most likely to occur if specific risks or scenarios are particularly salient to us. More generally, we are often overcondent in our beliefs, and thus fail to fully appreciate our uncertainty about the future. One of the most ubiquitous biases that lead to overcondent and inaccurate judgments is confirmation bias, the tendency to seek out and favor information that confirms our beliefs, while ignoring contrary information. In the context of our efforts to reduce sewering, this bias may result in a strong attachment to a particular strategy or cause area, which can in turn compromise our ability to objectively evaluate other causes and strategies. This highlights the need to remain open-minded and epistemically modest. After all, 
it is easy to overlook crucial considerations. Examples include animal advocates who give limited consideration to the issue of how animals sewer in nature or activists who may reduce far more sewering by focusing more on enuncing the long-term future. There is no reason to think that we have already uncovered all relevant considerations about the best priorities for reducing sewering. Section, concluding thoughts in light of the biases reviewed above, it comes as no surprise that few people actively work on reducing S risks. Even people who care about long-term outcomes tend to focus on achieving utopian outcomes or other priorities. This neglectedness is another strong reason to invest marginal resources in S risk reduction. Since the topic has not yet been explored in much detail, we might be able to make considerable progress when working on S risks. Particularly neglected are S risks that eat non-human beings, due to the combination of biases against taking S risks seriously and the generally insouciant level of moral concern for these sentient beings. The existence of biases against taking S risks seriously can therefore be an argument in favor of prioritizing S risks. Of course such an analysis of potential biases does not in itself give us strong reason to prioritize S risks. But in light of our great uncertainty, it seems valuable to consider a multitude of direct perspectives and arguments. We should also remain open to the possibility that there may be biases in the opposite direction that cause us to systematically overestimate the scale and likelihood of S risks. For instance, perhaps extreme scenarios are more interesting to discuss compared to more mundane futures, which may be why dystopian science shine is popular. Many people may also exhibit a negativity bias, which might contribute to a common tendency to believe in gloomy predictions about impending decline or catastrophe. This is at odds with many metrics that suggest that the world has actually improved over time. Still, I think it is more plausible, on balance, that we are biased to dismiss S risks. This is because many of the biases reviewed here seem strong and most of them are biases against a focus on S risk, whereas potential biases in favor of a focus on S risk seem weaker and fewer in number. This concludes my discussion of reasons for and against a focus on S risks. All things considered I think the case for each of the three underlying premises, long-term focus, sewering focus, and worst-case focus, is plausible, but not unassailable. Or, to put it dearly, I endorse moderate versions of each of those premises but not necessarily strong ones. In any case we should remain open-minded acknowledge that there are valid arguments for and against the focus on s risk, and be willing to change our mind if new evidence about the likelihood of s risk or the and feasibility of long. Terminum emerges. Part 3, How Can We Best Reduce s risk? Section Introduction. I hope that you are, at this point, convinced that s risk reduction is at least a plausible priority worthy of significant attention, even if you are not convinced that it should be our sole priority. The rest of the book will proceed on that basis, and focus on the practical question. What can we do to avert S risks? We must avoid many pitfalls in the endeavor of reducing S risks. The RST and perhaps most common pitfall is to underestimate the enormous complexity of the question of how to best reduce S risks. Given our great uncertainty about the future, it is unrealistic to expect a single, conclusive answer to this question. And as discussed in the previous chapter, cognitive biases can pull us towards overconfident views or a premature focus on a spec at cause area. A particular risk to be mindful of is our tendency to be more concerned with showing that we care about an issue, rather than actually solving it. One antidote is to cultivate epistemic humility and to actively seek out new information that can inform our approach to reducing S risks. Another pitfall is a lack of prudence. We should avoid approaches to S risk reduction that could easily back or, for instance, by antagonizing zing those with other priorities. For many reasons, it seems more productive to instead pursue a cooperative approach and to work towards aims at ND broad support. Lastly, we may fail to appreciate that any individual can, in a world of almost 8 billion people, only ever hope to have a limited, marginal impact. It is thus misguided to reason as if we can not single-handedly steer the future. This relates to the illusion of control, which is the tendency for people to overestimate their ability to control events. Given that our individual impact on the trajectory of humanity is limited, it is often not very useful to envision an ideal future, and then try to make that happen. A better alternative is to focus on how much impact additional resources could have on the margin when invested in a particular area. Yet this does not imply that our impact is small in absolute terms or that the endeavor of reducing S risks is futile. I am confident that this is not the case. We do have the power to achieve a lot, especially if we think carefully about how to best reduce S risks. Chapter 7, Risk Factors for S Risks. Suppose you want to evaluate how a given intervention would eat S risks. This is made to cult by the multitude of possible S risks, and by our great uncertainty about the future. The about Similar to past and contemporary forms of sewering, 
future sewering will likely result from a variety of issues rather than any single cause. We therefore need to consider measures for S risk reduction that are comparatively easy to assess, which will then simplify our discussion of specific interventions. In this chapter, I will introduce several risk factors for S risks. These risk factors are not S risks in and of themselves, but they significantly increase either the probability or the severity of a very bad outcome. The concept is also used frequently in medicine. For instance, an unbalanced diet or a lack of exercise are not adverse health outcomes in and of themselves, but they are risk factors for a plethora of medical problems, from heart disease to depression. This framework allows us to give sound advice for a healthy lifestyle without the need to analyze specific diseases, and the resulting conclusions are robust even though the health trajectory of any given individual is highly uncertain. By analogy, we might not need to know all eats that a given action will have on specific S risks. If we can identify reliable risk factors, we will be able to derive robust and active interventions for reducing a broad range of S risks. Section Advanced Technology and Space Colonization The simplest risk factor for S risks is the capacity of human civilization to create large amounts of sewering in the RST place. As discussed in Chapters 1 and 2, many S risks are only possible in the context of powerful new technologies that give rise to both unprecedented opportunities and unprecedented risks. In particular, the emergence of advanced AI could, due to its unprecedented power, constitute a serious S risk. As with the concept of medical risk factors, this does not mean that the emergence of such advanced technologies would necessarily cause an S risk to materialize. The point is merely that advanced technologies would equip humans with immense power, and thereby exacerbate the potential scope of worst case outcomes. We should also distinguish between more and less worrisome forms of technological progress. The relevant aspect is the eat that new technologies could have on the overall scale of human civilization, and on the number of potentially miserable sentient beings. In particular, some new technologies might make it easier to create large amounts of sewering. A concrete example of such a technology is the ability to create sentient artificial entities. As I have discussed in section 1.4, this might result in the exploitation of large numbers of sentient beings, due to our likely insouciant level of moral consideration for artificial minds. Another key factor is large-scale space colonization. Due to advanced AI or other technological breakthroughs, it might become technically and economically viable to expand throughout the universe. This expansion could potentially multiply the total population size of both human and non-human beings, resulting in a truly astronomical scope of our civilization. And without sufficient moral and political progress, this could multiply the amount of sewering entailed by our civilization. Thus space colonization, even with the best of intentions, poses significant risks. The potential scale of future civilization is mind-boggling. Astronomers estimate that there are minus 400 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way alone, and minus 200 billion galaxies throughout the universe. A future moral catastrophe on a galactic or intergalactic scale could therefore exceed Earth-based sewering by many orders of magnitude. By contrast, the amount of sewering is limited if we never expand into space. Some authors have further argued that space colonization will by default result in catastrophic outcomes. But this is highly uncertain, and a pessimistic view of space colonization is not necessary to establish that space colonization is a risk factor for S risks. Is the large-scale colonization of space a realistic prospect? Evidence on the feasibility of space colonization is scarce, but preliminary reviews suggest that the obstacles, from microgravity to travel across cosmic distances, are massive yet probably not insurmountable. It also remains unclear what the motivation to colonize other planets would be, considering that other planets are usually extremely inhospitable places when compared to Earth, and we are currently far from running out of available land. On the other hand, we face great uncertainty about what may or may not happen in the future, especially on long timescales. So we also cannot rule out the possibility that humanity will colonize space, and the scope of a galactic or intergalactic moral catastrophe could be so vast that an expected value framework suggests that we should take the possibility seriously, even if we do not consider large. Scale space colonization to be the most likely scenario. Section. Lack of adequate S risk prevention Human civilization can likely mitigate most forms of sewering, given sufficient motivation and political will to do so. Therefore, S risks are far more likely to occur if nobody works to prevent them. Even a limited degree of moral concern could go a long way towards mitigating S risks. For instance, if only a small number of people care about preventing an S risk, they can still try to and a compromise with others to implement low-cost measures that can prevent worst-case outcomes. Such low-cost compromises are likely to be possible for many S risks. It therefore seems plausible that we should be most worried about futures with Lili or no yurts to prevent S risks, and that we should address that apparent bolenic.
What could cause such a lack of yurts to prevent S risks? The simplest reason is sheer endearance, especially for S risks that eat those without any political representation or power. Future decision makers might be aware of S risks and be able to avert them, but they might not care enough about the sewering that their decisions cause or fail to prevent. In particular, a narrow moral circle could result in a disregard of S risks that eat non human animals or artificial sentience. Even if there is concern for S risks, it is possible that the resulting yurts are misguided or inactive. This could happen for many reasons. For instance, the idea of preventing S risks or reducing sewering might become associated with controversial political ideas and factions, which could in turn cause a backlash that thwarts progress towards preventing S risks. It is also possible that the relevant actors will want to avert an S risk, but doing so may be impossible due to inactive political institutions or cooperation problems. Or the relevant actors might lack the foresight to anticipate and address potential S risks at an early stage, and at a later point it might be impossible to change course, of course. This depends heavily on the specific S risk in question. Section, connect and hostility S risks are more likely if there is a high degree of hostility between future actors, with Lili or no common ground. It is of course not problematic per se if people endorse different perspectives or opinions. However, such divergences can constitute a risk factor for S risks when combined with a lack of understanding of other perspectives, or intolerance and hostility towards others. Connects can be problematic for several reasons. First, powerful factions or individuals might ride roughshod over the moral concerns of others. This is likely to impede yurts to prevent S risks, the lack of which is a risk factor, as per the previous section. A future that entails large-scale adversarial dynamics or ruthless competition would likely leave Lili room for prudent reaction on S risks or for mutually beneficial compromises. Negative outcomes would be significantly more likely in this case compared to a future where successful coordination makes it possible to implement countermeasures against potential risks. Second, hostile relations always carry a risk of escalating connects and even outright war between competing factions. It stands to reason that this increases the risk of worst-case outcomes. In particular, some actors might want to intentionally harm others out of hatred, sadism, or vengeance for real or alleged harm caused by others, as discussed in Chapter 2. Connects and wars tend to exacerbate our worst impulses. A related risk factor for S risks is insouciant security against bad actors. Human civilization contains many dire actors, including some malevolent ones. Such bad actors are usually reined in by norms and laws that prohibit harmful acts. Yet this might become the cult in some future scenarios. For instance, in the context of powerful autonomous AI agents or space colonization, it might become harder or even impossible to stop rogue actors from causing harm on a massive scale. This is related to the future evolution of the OWN's defense balance. Military applications of future technological advances could change the OWN's defense balance in a way that makes S risk more likely. A common concern is that strong OWN's of capabilities would enable a safe RST strike undermining global stability. Yet, when it comes to us risks, it is perhaps even more dangerous to tip the balance in favor of strong defense, since bad actors can no longer be deterred from harmful acts if they enjoy strong defensive advantages. Section, malevolent actors cruel dictators like Hitler and Stalin were responsible for many of the worst atrocities in human history. But how can we operationalize this notion of cruel or malevolent actors? A frequently used concept is the dark tetrad which consists of the following four personality traits. Psychopathy is characterized by persistent antisocial behavior, impaired empathy, callousness, and impulsiveness. Narcissism involves an innate sense of one's importance and abilities, an excessive need for admiration, and an obsession with achieving fame or power. Machiavellianism is characterized by manipulating and deceiving others to further one's own interests, endearance to common norms, and ruthless pursuit of power or wealth. Sadism is the tendency to derive pleasure from enacting suing and pain on others. Individuals with malevolent traits can pose serious risks if they rise to positions of power. And they often do after all. The hallmarks of malevolence include strategic ruthlessness and a lust for power. These traits are often an advantage in the struggle for power, especially in earthly competitive systems. Malevolent individuals and power can cause a variety of negative outcomes. The aspects that are most relevant to us risks include an erosion of interpersonal trust and coordination and increased risk of escalating connects and war and an increased likelihood of reckless behavior in high-stakes situations. A concrete pathway to an S-risk is the formation of a global totalitarian regime under a malevolent leader, which could potentially result in a permanent lock and of ruthless values and power structures. Historical examples of totalitarian regimes, for example Nazi Germany or Stalinist Russia, were temporary and localized, but a stable global dictatorship may become possible in the future.
Risks from malevolent actors are exacerbated if those actors have access to advanced technology, such as powerful AI. In the worst case, this might enable a cruel individual in a position of power to create suing on an unprecedented scale. Section: How risk factors interact. It would be misguided to view each risk factor as independent. Instead, there are numerous connections and complex interactions between the factors I outlined. For instance, polarization and connect can increase the likelihood that a malevolent individual rises to power. A dictatorship under a malevolent leader would, in turn, likely impede efforts to prevent s risks. Advanced technology could potentially multiply the harm caused by malevolent individuals, and so on. Conversely, the presence of a single risk factor can, at least to some extent, be mitigated by otherwise favorable circumstances. Advanced technological capabilities are much less worrisome if there are adequate efforts to mitigate s risks. Likewise, without advanced technological capabilities or space colonization. The suing caused by a malevolent dictator would at least be limited to Earth. It therefore seems plausible that most expected s risks occur in worlds where several risk factors coincide. The risk might even scale in a superlinear way. This would mean that if two risk factors materialize, the likelihood of an s risks is more than twice as high compared to a future where only a single risk factor materializes. Chapter eight: Moral advocacy. Many factors can influence future outcomes. These include technological progress, economic dynamics, cooperation problems, and political or cultural trends. But perhaps the most fundamental determinant of how the future will go are the values of relevant decision makers. We can only make progress on issues from wild animal suing to s risks if sufficiently many people care about them, thus creating the necessary political will to tackle these issues. Advancing better values could therefore be a good lever for reducing s risks. This relates directly to the risk factors for s risks that we discussed in the previous chapter. Better values increase the probability that adequate actions will be taken to prevent s risks. In particular, better values make it more likely that advanced technology will be used responsibly, even if we cannot accurately predict how the world will change. We may be able to leave many future problems to future people, but only if they share our values. Section expanding the moral circle throughout the earlier chapters. We have seen that many s risks relate to the disregard of the interests of non-human beings. Thus, a top candidate for what it means to promote better values is to ensure the moral consideration of all sentient beings. We should promote concern for suing, irrespective of who is experiencing it, no matter who they are, what time they live in, or what species they belong to. This approach has been termed moral circle expansion. The moral circle refers to the set of beings or entities whom we grant moral consideration. An expanded moral circle would, so the argument goes. Reduce the risk that neglected types of future sentient beings will be harmed on a large scale. A key aspect of moral circle expansion is the rejection of speciesism, the discrimination against beings who belong to a different species. As famously argued by Peter Singer in Animal Liberation, this can be viewed as a form of discrimination that is just as untenable as discrimination based on an individual's ethnicity, sex, or age. Sentience should form the basis of moral consideration, not an individual species membership or any other morally irrelevant characteristic. We should give equal priority to equal interests and to equal suing in particular. Speciesist or anthropocentric attitudes are the key drivers behind our disregard of many non-human beings, as well as the horrendous harms we enact on animals in factory farms and slaughterhouses. Thus, we can likely prevent a lot of future suing if we manage to spread anti-speciesist views and improve attitudes towards non-human animals. But the expansion of the moral circle goes further than that. Beyond the sentient beings inhabiting Earth today. We should also consider the possibility of novel forms of sentience that might emerge in the future, as discussed in section 1.4. It is conceivable that sentient artificial entities could be created at some point. If that were to happen, it is crucial that we extend moral consideration to such artificial minds, including disembodied or voiceless ones, especially if they are created in large numbers. That said, we must distinguish carefully between dire end aims. If our core aim is to reduce s risks. We should be careful not to uncritically assume that expanding the moral circle is perfectly convergent with our core aim, and expanding the moral circle is in turn distinct from the goal of improving the welfare of farmed animals in the here and now. While these direct goals are clearly related, it would be a remarkable coincidence if the same interventions happen to be ideal in terms of several distinct goals at the same time. Instead, we will likely arrive at somewhat direct interventions when focusing on s risk reduction compared to if we were focusing chira on those other goals. It would also be misguided, though, to conclude that animal advocacy efforts are unimportant from a long-term or s risk-focused perspective. Most animal advocates currently focus on human-caused animal suing in the relative, short term, but their messages could be broadened to encompass all sentient beings, including wild animals and potential artificial minds.
Likewise, establishing basic rights for some non-human animals could set legal and social precedents that may help us to later expand protections to other classes of sentient beings. Section Risks of moral circle expansion The basic argument for why moral circle expansion reduces s risks seems intuitively plausible. A larger moral circle increases the likelihood that adequate measures will be taken to prevent s risks, especially those that eat non-human beings who are often excluded from moral consideration. Yet on closer inspection, the relationship between s risks and moral circle expansion is not as straightforward as it might appear. A larger moral circle could back or in combination with the wrong values or beliefs. For example, concern for wild animals could, in combination with certain environmentalist values, result in increased efforts to preserve nature in its current state, in spite of the immense amounts of animal suring in nature. Or a larger moral circle could result in the creation of more potentially suring sentient beings when combined with highly optimistic moral views, according to which suring can readily be outweighed by other goods. If not done carefully, moral advocacy also risks a backlash that could further entrench bad values or antagonistic dynamics. In the worst case, the idea of caring about all sentient beings might become a divisive hot boo on issue, akin to ongoing culture wars. As discussed in the previous chapter, such polarization would be a substantial risk factor for s risks. This can be a strong reason to avoid a confrontational approach. We can and should be assertive about our values, but we should also be friendly and cooperative in our efforts to convince others, so that we do not accidentally push people towards worse values. A grave deterioration of values could potentially result in agents with outright malevolent, vindictive, or sadistic attitudes and goals, and the aim of the optimal values may be less important in terms of s risk prevention than the avoidance of uniquely bad values. This may be especially true if s risks are heavy-tailed, as discussed in Chapter Five, Section Robust Forms of Moral Circle Expansion. The risks and caveats outlined above are reasons to doubt whether generic work to expand the moral circle is a top priority from an s-risk perspective. Still, expanding the moral circle seems likely to do more good than bad in expectation, and therefore remains an endeavor that is worth supporting. Instead of refraining from moral circle expansion altogether, we need to end the ways to expand the moral circle in thoughtful, sustainable, and prudent ways. Targeted forms of advocacy can be robustly positive for s-risk prevention if they avoid the drawbacks of moral circle expansion. Likewise, it can be robustly positive to improve and develop existing social movements by increasing the degree to which they are able and motivated to reduce s risks. In addition to other goals, the animal advocacy movement seems particularly relevant in this context. In the following, I will outline suggestions for how the animal movement can become even more active at reducing the suring of all sentient beings, from a perspective that takes s risks into account. First. It is vital that we, as animal advocates, always remain open-minded and willing to learn more. This relates not just to empirical facts or strategic considerations, but also to foundational philosophical beliefs. For example, many animal rights activists have given lively consideration to issues such as the suring of animals living in nature, the vast quantities of invertebrates such as insects, or the possible sentience of artificial entities. If the animal advocacy movement is to be a movement for all sentient beings, We need to give deeper consideration to these neglected issues. Second, the movement would do well to, on the margin, focus more on long-term considerations. While it is urgent and important to alleviate animal suring in the short term, this should not be the sole focus of our efforts. Given the potentially much larger number of future beings, a long-term outlook entails an emphasis on achieving lasting social change and on ensuring the long-term stability of the movement. It is vital to avoid actions that impair our ability to achieve our long-term goals. As individuals, as organizations, and as a movement. Third, it is probably best to avoid needless controversy and to advance concern for non-human beings in a non-partisan way. For example, it is helpful to emphasize that the cause of reducing animal suring draws support from the entire political spectrum, including conservative and libertarian voices. Such a cooperative approach reduces the risk of a serious backlash that could jeopardize our long-term interests. To be clear. A cooperative approach is perfectly compatible with being assertive about the moral importance of all sentient beings. Research suggests that a main driver of the backlash and hostility of some meat eaters towards vegans and vegetarians is a perception of being judged as morally inferior. So we should take care to avoid triggering such a perception. For example, by primarily framing the issue of animal suring in institutional or political terms, rather than in terms of individual food choices. Section. Promoting concern for suring and other promising strategies is the promotion of concern for suring. To counter the possible downsides of moral circle expansion, we could further develop and advance suring-focused views in addition to advancing moral consideration of all sentient beings.
A key advantage of this strategy is that people who endorse Suring focused views are particularly likely to prioritize S risk reduction. New information can always change our assessment of a concrete intervention or policy, but agreement at the level of fundamental ethical principles seems robustly good, even in the face of great uncertainty. So, advancing Suring focused views might be a uniquely robust and active way to reduce S risk, of course. This strategy only makes sense if you endorse Suring focused views yourself. Promoting concern for Suring can take many forms. An important part is the renaming and dissemination of philosophical arguments that support a special priority to the reduction of Suring. To be clear, any exploration of Suring focused ethics should always be done in an intellectually honest way, ideally with an emphasis on cooperation with other value systems. The Center for Reducing Suring, which I co-founded, is an example of an organization that follows this approach. Other options include raising awareness of real-world cases of extreme suring, or helping people close the gap between their ideals and their actions, for example, by overcoming defense mechanisms such as denial or wishful thinking. Similar to moral circle expansion, it is generally best to advance concern for suring in a nonpartisan and nuanced way to improve the chances that suring reduction becomes a common goal rather than a controversial issue. Section Conclusion Moral advocacy can be an active strategy to reduce S risks especially if done in a careful and prudent way that avoids backer risks. Of course, this brief overview does not answer the question of whether moral advocacy is the most active way to reduce S risks or improve the long-term future. That depends on the tractability of long-term social change, the activeness of other interventions, the time sensitivity of moral circle expansion, and many other factors. If we decide that promoting certain values is important, we still need to ND the best ways to do so. For example, animal advocacy can take many forms, including corporate campaigns in favor of animal welfare reforms, efforts to advance research and development of plant-based or cultivated meat, or philosophical arguments against speciesism. However, a detailed discussion of strategic questions relating to animal advocacy is beyond the scope of this book. Chapter 9: Better Politics Are Political Institutions and Discourse Relate Directly to Several Risk Factors for S Risks. Dysfunctional politics can foster polarization, thwart efforts to prevent S risks. And increase the risk of malevolent actors rising to positions of power. Efforts to improve politics are therefore a plausible lever to tackle less risks. More broadly, a functional political system puts society in a better position to handle the challenges of the future, including the challenge of averting potential less risks. Political decisions are the linchpin of our collective decision making, and our political system is currently operating far from ideally. To put it mildly, we can and should do better. How to achieve better politics is, of course, a complex question. It is impossible to cover all relevant aspects in this book, so I will focus on proposals that seem particularly promising or important from an S risk perspective. For a more comprehensive analysis, I refer the reader to Magnus Vinding's freely available book Reason Politics. Section: The two-step ideal. It is worth aspiring to a two-step ideal of politics that involves a normative step followed by an empirical step. The normative step is to clarify the aims and values that underlie our policymaking. This is not about merely stating our goals. But also about open-minded conversation and moral argument to discuss and renew the values that should form the bedrock of our collective decision making. Once we have identified a set of carefully reacted values, the empirical step is to ask which policies are optimal for achieving our aims. This is usually a complex factual question, which requires us to draw on the best available evidence and to engage in an open-ended scientific investigation and discussion. In short, the two-step ideal recommends that we adopt the mindset of a moral philosopher. In the normative step, and then that of a scientist in the empirical step. By contrast, contemporary political rhetoric often confuses empirical and normative aspects, which hampers clear thinking. Following the two-step ideal would likely enable greater precision in our political conversations, as it helps us to clarify where we disagree and where we have common ground. This, in turn, allows for more fruitful political discourse, mutually beneficial compromises, and perhaps even moral progress. Efforts to move closer to the two-step ideal go hand in hand with an awareness of the various biases that often prevent us from approaching policy questions with an open mind. The most common biases include confirmation bias, as discussed in section 6.3, and motivated reasoning, which is when we seek to justify a desired conclusion rather than following the evidence where it leads. Overconfident political views are also ubiquitous, in spite of the complexity of most policy questions and the fact that most voters are not well informed about politics. This underscores the need for a deliberate ear to overcome biases and to approach political issues as open questions by consciously seeking open moral argument and empirical evidence, rather than relying too strongly on immediate intuitions. We can likely reduce political overconfidence.
In particular, it seems beneficial to focus more on understanding how a suggested policy works, rather than jumping to support or oppose it. What does an improved culture of political discourse have to do with S risk reduction? It is, of course, not easy to pinpoint or quantify the eeks, yet it seems plausible that more reasoned political thinking and debate would serve as an antidote to the risk factor of excessive polarization, and that it reduces the likelihood that populist demagogues with malevolent traits are able to rise to power. Greater adherence to the two step ideal would therefore likely reduce S risks, while also contributing to better outcomes more broadly. Section Overcoming our tribal nature muddled thinking. Or lack of information are arguably not the only distorting factors in contemporary politics. Another core problem is our tribal nature. A kinding of modern political science is that social attachments to groups are among the most important factors determining our political judgments. This is in line with the idea that the primary purpose of our political behavior is loyalty signaling, to express our allegiance to a party, social movement, or other community. According to this theory, political debate is not sure about promoting good policies or arriving at some notion of truth. Instead, we mostly cheer for our team and boo their team in a zero sum game. A closely related concept is hot cognition. Our brains tend to automatically process political individuals and issues in emotionally charged ways. We instinctively view our own political tribe and leaders in a positive light and the other side in a negative light. In the worst case, this can spiral into the vilification or scapegoating of certain individuals or outgroups, for instance, ethnic minorities. Our propensity for loyalty signaling and hot cognition explains many of our biases. For example, the drive to signal loyalty often leads us to display a high degree of over condense in the core tenets of our own group and hostility towards rival groups. Expressions of uncertainty and nuance do not tee this team sports mentality. Every argument and even the facts must favor one's own team, lest one is seen as disloyal. Text to speech note. See comic on page 68. Considering how ubiquitous and detrimental these dynamics are, It is imperative that we resist the pull of loyalty signaling. This will be challenging, as it requires us to overcome tendencies that are deeply ingrained in our psychology. A helpful strategy is a heuristic in favor of nuance. If we acknowledge grains of truth in direct perspectives, and think in terms of degrees of credence rather than rigid certainties, we can't avoid us versus them and black or white thinking. Another good heuristic is a norm of being charitable and respectful toward political opponents. By engaging with the strongest interpretation of their views and arguments. And again, it is worth emphasizing the shared goal of better understanding how a given policy works, instead of rushing to divide people into supporting and opposing camps. Overcoming our tribal instincts is directly relevant to S risk reduction. Limiting the inundance of biased intuitions and dogmatic partisan loyalties helps avoid excessive political polarization, which constitutes a risk factor for S risks, as discussed in Chapter 7. And more charitable political conversations arguably make escalating zero sum connects and resulting worst case outcomes less likely. Raising the standards of political discourse could therefore be a promising way to reduce S risk. Reducing tribalism also opens up avenues for cooperation and compromise, which increases the likelihood that everyone's moral concerns are taken into account. To be clear, a certain degree of political competition is both healthy and unavoidable. Yet politics can often be win win if we think in terms of policy outcomes. And not in terms of beating the other faction. It is worth noting that extensive loyalty signaling frequently creates the appearance of major disagreements when there are actually only limited disagreements in terms of policy substance. We are often less divided than we think. Indeed, the prevention of severe suring is a good example of a widely shared and uncontroversial value. This is also a reason to focus political discourse more on policies and less on parties or individuals. The law lends itself to tribal mudslinging smears and name calling. While discussions of policy substance tend to be more fruitful, especially when we focus on mutually beneficial policies. Section Institutional Reform The previous sections focused on our political culture. Yet our political institutions are perhaps just as vital. For example, fundamental principles such as democracy, the rule of law, and basic human rights are arguably essential to achieving stability, prosperity, and liberty. To see how important these principles and the corresponding institutions are, one only needs to compare North Korea and South Korea. From an S risk perspective, important goals are to prevent excessive polarization, to keep malevolent individuals in check, and to prevent a descent into totalitarianism. Functioning democratic institutions can provide checks and balances to ensure that any single individual can never gain too much power, thus reducing the inundance of malevolent actors. Conversely, a dysfunctional system often allows the most ruthless and strategic individuals with malevolent traits to rise to power, resulting in a pathocracy. Years to strengthen democratic governance can therefore be a promising lever for reducing S risks.
Of course, myriad proposals for how to improve governance have been brought forward, and a detailed analysis is beyond the scope of this book. In the following I will focus on a brief overview of reforms that are particularly evidence-based and relevant for S risks. Section Parliamentarism An example of a promising institutional reform is the switch to a parliamentary system of government in countries that currently use the presidential system. A growing body of evidence suggests that the parliamentary system is superior in many ways. In particular research indicates that countries using the parliamentary system exhibit lower levels of political polarization, less economic inequality, and a lower risk of democratic backsliding compared to presidential countries. The parliamentary system is also likely better in terms of keeping malevolent actors in check. This is because power is more decentralized, and the head of government can be dismissed fairly easily, whereas the president is usually elected for a Z term in a presidential system. Overall, it seems plausible that parliamentarism mitigates several key risk factors for S risk, but there is still significant uncertainty about the each size. The best ways to promote parliamentarism and the tractability of switching systems in countries that have a long presidential tradition, like the US. Voting reform Another institutional issue in modern democracies is the use of majoritarian voting systems. An example is the plurality voting or first-past-the-post system, which determines a single winner per district. Everyone gets a vote, and the candidate with the most votes wins. This system is used in many major democracies including the United Kingdom, the United States, and India. An advantage of plurality voting is its simplicity. However, plurality voting usually does not achieve representative results, as the share of seats won by a party can diverge significantly from its vote share. According to Duverger's law, the winner takes all nature of the system tends to create a two-party system. This can contribute to excessive polarization because the two-party system feeds into our tribal nature. If there are only two opposite poles, political actors have an incentive to focus more on demonizing the other party than on achieving anything of substance. A prominent example of this dynamic is the excessive polarization between Democrats and Republicans in the United States. By contrast, proportional voting systems, which translate the share of votes into a roughly equal share of seats, usually result in a multi-party system. If no party achieves a majority on their own, parties have to work together and compromise. This does not always work perfectly but the shifting coalitions still react a more cooperative model of politics and mitigate the tribal us versus them mentality. This story is borne out by the available evidence. Countries that use proportional representation generally feature less political polarization, higher voter turnout, higher satisfaction with democratic institutions, less economic inequality, along with various other advantages. Research also suggests that democracies that use a proportional voting system have significantly lower war involvement compared to democracies that use a majoritarian system. Proportional representation is closely linked to parliamentarism. A presidential election necessarily has a single winner and is therefore in a sense, maximally disproportional. So the advantages of proportional representation cannot be fully realized in a presidential system. This suggests that the ideal endpoint of reform is a proportional parliamentary system. It is worth noting that ongoing voting reform yards often attempt to replace plurality voting while retaining a, non-proportional, system based on single winner districts. For instance, many groups in the United States focus on the introduction of ranked choice voting, while ranked choice voting would likely be a modest improvement over the status quo of plurality voting, it would likely fail to fully bring about the above-mentioned benefits of a proportional system. So it seems preferable to focus on more ambitious reforms. Section, Advancing and Safeguarding Democracy From an S-Risk Perspective, It is perhaps more important to avoid catastrophic institutional failures and to strive for the best possible institutions. The dearance in S-Risk terms, between a democracy and an autocratic or totalitarian system may be larger than the dearance between a functional democracy and a odd democracy. Modern liberal democracies owe much better protection of human rights and civil liberties like free speech. These fundamental rights are a precondition for being able to raise moral concerns, which is one reason why their frequent suppression in autocratic systems constitutes a risk factor for S risks. Democratic principles and institutions have also been designed to have checks in place to reduce the innocence of malevolent individuals. While democracies are not always successful in preventing malevolent rule, they appear better than any other system in this regard. So it seems likely that democracy helps reduce S risks, taking into account, also that war between democratic countries seems uniquely rare. This leaves open how we can best promote democracy. It is unclear whether we should focus most strongly on advancing liberal democracy in currently non-democratic nations, on safeguarding existing democracies against democratic backsliding, or on strengthening democracy in semi-democratic states. In addition, it is critical to ensure that promoting democracy is not used as a pretext to pursue economic or foreign policy interests.
Such misuse is highly unfortunate as it can discredit the idea of advancing democracy and even contribute to great power connect. Section Political representation of all sentient beings Another proposal is the idea of extending political representation to all sentient beings, including non-human animals. Non-human animals cannot represent their interests themselves, but we could, for instance, institute commissioners on their behalf who are solely tasked with defending the interests of non-human animals. This has been termed sentientist democracy or sentocracy. Similarly, an argument can be made that we should grant representation to future individuals, another class of individuals that go wholly unrepresented in current institutions. The political representation of all sentient beings would likely reduce s risks because it would, similar to moral advocacy, result in better protections of previously neglected individuals, at least in theory. On the other hand, a sentiocracy would be relatively uncharted territory compared to the other reform proposals listed above, which have already proven successful in many countries and are backed by tangible evidence. Is politics too crowded? I have so far bracketed questions about the activeness or tractability of irrits to improve politics. One might argue that the area is too crowded due to a plethora of actors vying for political innuns. And if there were any easy solutions to political dysfunctionality, why have they not already been found and implemented? There is an element of truth to this, but I believe that irrits to improve politics can still be valuable for many reasons. While many people pursue some political agenda, a much smaller number is systematically working to improve our political culture or institutions in an active and evidence-based way drawing on the best available scientific insights. And aspects that relate to us risk in particular like malevolent traits, or the representation of non-human beings, are more neglected still. Also even a marginal improvement of political culture or institutions can potentially be highly beneficial. Transformative change will not happen overnight. But it is quite realistic that we could become somewhat less biased and somewhat less tribal or that our institutions could be somewhat more functional. We can plausibly increase the degree to which our politics is based on carefully reacted values and sound empirical evidence. Section Conclusion While it is the cult to know what the ideal political institutions or culture would look like the bar for doing better than the status quo seems low. And another reason for optimism is that many insights about our political psychology and biases are fairly recent and have not yet fully trickled into the public's awareness likewise evidence. Based things on the Bennett's of parliamentarism or proportional representation are yet to reach a wider audience. A key advantage of many of the above proposals is that they are beneficial from many perspectives, and not only in terms of reducing S risks. This chimes with a cooperative approach to S risk reduction and increases the likelihood of gaining enough traction to achieve positive change. Finally, it is often important to state and aim for ideals even if their large scale adoption is not feasible in the foreseeable future. Continuous modest improvements can, over a sufficiently long time horizon, add up to transformative change. And a good starting point is to follow the two step ideal in our own thinking and communication, and to set an example by advancing the principles of reasoned political discourse within our own communities. Chapter 10 Emerging Technologies I have so far not addressed the risk factor of advanced technology. If transformative technologies emerge in the future, it seems plausible that shaping their development could be a good lever to announce the long term future and to reduce S risks. I will bracket AMS to stop technological progress altogether. This may in theory, help prevent S risks, but it is unrealistic to expect that we could stop all progress forever even if it may be feasible to prevent certain kinds of harmful technologies. Moreover, trying to stop progress is likely to provoke connect with those who want to reap the benefits of advanced technology instead my focus will be on measures to ensure the prudent and responsible use of potentially pivotal technologies. Should we focus on shaping artificial intelligence? Advanced artificial intelligence AI is one of the most frequently discussed examples of a potentially transformative technology. If we create systems that can surpass humans in terms of general intelligence, then this would, so the argument goes constitute a pivotal event in human history. Such a system could, due to its superhuman intelligence, actively take over the world and shape everything that happens later on according to its values. If it is plausible that we create extremely powerful AI in the not too distant future, Say this century it stands to reason that enuncing this process is a top priority. Shaping the development and use of advanced AI could be an extraordinarily consequential lever to enunce the long-term future. Indeed, years to reduce S risks caused by AI may be considered more targeted or more direct than the other interventions I have discussed so far, such as moral advocacy or better politics. After all a large share, perhaps a majority, of expected future suring stems from scenarios that feature advanced technology, CF. Chapter 7. Work to avert S-risk caused by AI is also highly neglected, 
A small number of people do research on AI safety L that centers on the question of how to ensure that the goals of autonomous AI systems are aligned with those of its creators. Yet alignment would likely not be sufficient to prevent potential S risks resulting from an imprudent development or use of powerful AI, which suggests that more targeted measures are needed. Since few people have so far considered AI safety from an S risk perspective, we can't expect that there are still low hanging fruits left to reap. On the other hand, there are good reasons to be skeptical about predictions regarding future technology, especially when the claims in question are far reaching. Considering the current capabilities of artificial intelligence and the pace of progress in the ELD, a rapid takeover of human civilization by super intelligent AI seems unlikely to me, at least in the foreseeable future. In general, we do not know much about what future technologies will look like. Details of technological advances are hard to predict, and we lack clear feedback loops or an empirical grounding to make content predictions. So the risk is high that our yurts to directly shape IO will be inactive, if not wasted altogether, as we have limited knowledge about the nature of this technology, or we might be misguided about which future technologies will be most consequential. We also need to unpack concepts like intelligence, and by extension superintelligence, as they are often used in a broad and simplistic way. For instance, one might think that the capabilities of modern civilization are exclusively owed to the great power of individual human intelligence, but a closer look reveals that individual intelligence is just part of the picture, and that social learning and cultural accumulation of more and more tools are in large part, the secrets to our success. It is also doubtful whether advanced AI will be a single unit, all-purpose system. The trends we have seen so far in automation and software lend more support to a progressive increase, through many distributed innovations, in the collective capabilities of our civilization, rather than a sudden jump in the capabilities of a single actor. I will likely become superhuman in one domain after another as it has in various domains for decades, rather than suddenly becoming superhuman in all domains at the same time. In this case the emergence of powerful eye would not be an isolated event, instead, it would happen gradually. This would likely mean that there is no single exceptional lever, or silver bullet to shape the future, and reduce s risks. Likewise, there was arguably no single leverage point or pivotal technology in the past that determined the course of history. Another key consideration is that technological developments are never divorced from their political and sociocultural context. Here it's to improve values or political culture, as opposed to directly shaping AI can therefore also indirectly announce the emergence of powerful AI. Indeed, even if there is just a single leverage point, and even if we know what it will look like, it is still possible that improving background factors like our values or institutions might be the most active way to shape the outcome. Where does this leave us? Despite the objections outlined above, it is still plausible that AI will be a critical future technology. I could take over the world in the same sense in which the computer or the internet took over the world, gradually and over time. And given the far-reaching consequences of such a transformative technology, research into mitigating risks, as well as better understanding the nature of the risk, might be worthwhile despite considerable uncertainty. Section Technical Measures to Reduce S Risks from AI What could an S risk focused approach to AI safety look like? I have mentioned before that destructive interactions and escalating connects can pose a serious S risk in Chapter 2. This risk seems particularly pronounced in interactions between advanced AI systems as they constitute a new and powerful type of actor. Interventions to achieve cooperative AI therefore seem particularly promising for S risk reduction. The goal of research on cooperative AI is to not just build intelligent systems, but to equip these systems with the necessary techniques and methods to achieve mutually beneficial outcomes and interactions with other agents. For example, research on bargaining, game theory, or decision theory in an AI context could yield insights that help prevent negative sum dynamics and navigate cooperation problems more productively. Likewise, a careful design of the training environment can help mitigate the risk that some analog of malevolent traits might evolve in AI systems. These lines of research, which aim to avoid S risks resulting from failures of cooperation or escalating connects among powerful AI are pursued by the Center on Long-Term Risk. A concrete example of a promising safety measure is the implementation of a surrogate goal in AI systems. The idea is to add to one's current goals an additional surrogate goal that one did not initially care about. In case of escalating connects, adversarial actors will in theory target the surrogate goal rather than what one initially cared about. This could subject to further research, Help limit the downsides of cooperation failures by dictating the disvalue resulting from adversarial dynamics onto the surrogate goal. Another intervention is to prevent the emergence of malevolent heuristics or character traits of newly trained AI systems. Just like dark tetrad traits evolved in human evolution, multi agent AI training environments could incentivize alien equivalents of these dark tetrad traits in the motivations of AI systems. 
By studying the incentivizes reinforced in the training environment of transformative IA systems, one could try to make sure that such antisocial tendencies don't show up in the RST place. We can also take inspiration from common engineering approaches to improve the reliability of safety critical systems, such as redundant and fail safe designs. Redundant designs duplicate important components of a safety critical system to serve as backups in case of primary component failures, for example, backup power generators while fail. Safety refers to design features whose sole function is to limit the extent of harm in case of a particular type of failure, for example, resuppression systems. By analogy, we might aim to specifically limit the extent of damage in the event of a failure to align advanced AI with human values. And we could aim to make AI safer by combining many dire and safety measures that kick in if the system fails. Yet a complete and watertight solution to the perils of advanced AI remains elusive. Many if not all of the suggested technical interventions may turn out to be infeasible. And it is possible in light of great uncertainty that safety yurts could backer and inadvertently increase the risk of escalating connect. So we need further research into how to best prevent s risk caused by AI. Section, governance of AI technical safety measures are only one side of the coin. It seems just as important to advance good governance mechanisms that help navigate the transition to a world with advanced AI. In particular, we should establish norms, policies, and institutions that help prevent worst case risks due to AI. For example, we could promote international cooperation to prevent escalating arms race dynamics between competing nations. This could be achieved through agreements akin to other international treaties to ensure the prudent and cooperative, rather than hasty and adversarial, development of advanced AI. International bodies could be established to oversee AI development. Likewise, AI companies could agree on formal or informal rules about how to proceed if an artificial intelligence approaches certain capabilities. Of course, any such agreement might be to call to enforce it is worth noting that S. Risks from AI would likely take place in circumstances that deer radically from our current world. The emergence of a transformative technology, such as advanced AI carries a significant risk of political turmoil, which means that things we normally take for granted, like the rule of law or democratic institutions, might break down. This in turn is a risk factor for S risks. So it is valuable to look into how political turmoil in a potential transition period to advanced AI can be avoided, and how we can ensure that laws, rules, or agreements will still apply in this context. Another aspect that seems particularly important from an S-risk perspective is the potential misuse of AI by malevolent actors. As part of Yurts to reduce the innocence of malevolent individuals, it is vital to limit their ability to misuse advanced technology. For instance, it might be worthwhile to raise awareness of the risks of malevolent individuals within AI companies, or to establish protocols to make AI-related institutions less susceptible to adversarial actors. And we could try to distribute future technological capabilities in a way that makes it difficult or impossible for any single actor to cause a lot of harm including, but not limited to, S risks. Finally, we could try to expand the moral circle of the creators of AI for instance by establishing standards for how to proceed if an artificial intelligence appeared to demonstrate some degree of sentience. This connects a focus on advanced AI with moral advocacy. However, year it's to promote the moral consideration of artificial sentience must be planned carefully lest we inadvertently cause a backlash as discussed in Chapter 8. It seems most robust to focus on further research, and thereby contribute to a nuanced and reactive discussion of issues relating to artificial sentience. Section Space Governance So far, I have focused exclusively on risks from artificial intelligence. But the risk factor of advanced technology also entails other aspects. In particular, many S risks are linked to a large-scale colonization of outer space, which suggests that space governance could be another potential focus area for S risk reduction. Space governance encompasses the laws, rules, norms, and institutions that structure interactions in space, as well as mechanisms that are used to establish and enforce those. We currently lack a global framework for space governance. As of now, space is mostly a free for all, which poses a risk of race dynamics and severe connects. So it could be valuable to replace the current state of ambiguity with coherent regulations that contribute to positive long term outcomes if, and when large-scale space colonization becomes feasible. To this end, we can do research to undi out which governance mechanisms are most suitable, and then lobby for corresponding treaties or conventions. One could also think that the easiest way to avoid S risks is to oppose space colonization altogether. Yet it is important to be pragmatic. If space colonization is inevitable, then dogmatic opposition may be counterproductive, especially if it antagonizes those who wish to colonize space. So it seems more fruitful to emphasize the idea that we should only embark on such an astronomical endeavor after having done everything we can to ensure a positive outcome. Put simply, we should get our house in order on Earth before we consider spreading into space. Chapter 11. Long-Term Impact. We tend to mostly think about what we can do right now. 
Yet it pays to adopt a long-term perspective in our years to tackle less risks, as the best opportunities might arise in the distant, future. Indeed, it would be a striking coincidence if, among all possible times, today is the single most active time for ERTs to avert S risks. Section, capacity building the most important thing to do now might be to ensure that future actors will be both motivated and able to prevent S risks. Through such capacity building, we will be prepared to make the best possible use of opportunities to reduce S risks when they arise in the future. So perhaps we should now invest in exable capacity to multiply our future impact. This is a uniquely robust strategy to deal with our vast uncertainty about the future. After all, we know relatively, lily about what the future will look like, about how we can best enhance it, and about how we can best reduce S risks in particular. This is especially true for S risks that lie in the distant future or involve advanced technology. Yet we can still, despite great uncertainty, have a reliably positive impact by accruing exable resources until we see more clearly how worst case outcomes might occur and what potential countermeasures may be available. Capacity building can take many forms. For example, money is an exable resource that can be transferred to the future through saving and investing. If long-term financial returns outpace a nation, we can potentially accumulate a large sum of money to spend on S risk reduction at a later point. But capacity building is about much more than purely financial investments. In fact, many of the interventions I have discussed so far also help build capacity. If we promote greater concern for suring and the moral consideration of all sentient beings, we increase the motivation of future people to prevent S risks that eat non-human beings. And if we improve our political culture and institutions, we improve the capacity of future civilization to address any future challenge, including potential S risks. Section, a movement to reduce S risks, a key dimension of capacity building is movement building to foster a community of people who are interested in and knowledgeable about S-risk reduction. After all, the current degree of concern for S-risks seems clearly insufficient. By making reasoned arguments for why S-risks should be taken seriously, we can connect with a broader set of people. Ideally, we can build a growing movement that will help steer humanity away from a future moral catastrophe. However, the strategy also comes with significant risks. For instance, investments might become worthless in the event of a financial crash or political turmoil. Overall, it seems unclear whether we should invest more or spend more now, relative to the status quo. Beyond growth, the main priority is to ensure the long-term stability of the movement to reduce S risks. We should be mindful of the possibility that ideas relating to S risks might evolve in undesirable directions. In the worst case the movement could fall into disrepute, which could result in a lack of ears to prevent worst case outcomes. This is similar to concerns about how moral advocacy might engender a backlash, as discussed in Chapter 8. To reduce this risk, it is important to establish healthy social norms among those who seek to reduce S risks. A friendly and welcoming community is more likely to draw people in. And a cooperative attitude towards those who pursue other priorities tends to be more productive than a provocative or antagonistic approach. After all, virtually everyone can agree that S risks should be prevented. So it is often possible to end the common ground. Finally, it is vital that the movement to reduce S risks is cause neutral. In light of great uncertainty, we should not let our priorities be dictated by personal attachments to a particular cause. Akin to individuals who may be biased in their judgment cf. Chapter 6, an entire movement can also focus prematurely on a narrow cause. To achieve its full potential, the movement must be able to update its views and change course based on new evidence. We need to react exably to social and technological developments to indeed the most active ways to prevent S risks. Section Research on how to best reduce S risks movement building primarily addresses the motivation to avoid a future moral catastrophe. Yet our competence in this endeavor is just as important. Expanding our knowledge is a key dimension of capacity building, as it puts compassionate future actors in a better position to reduce S risks. One could call it wisdom building, given our great uncertainty about the future. Any attempt to reduce S risk requires careful thought. Indeed, the priority areas outlined so far in chapters 8-10 are merely current best guesses. It remains unclear which of these areas are most promising, and perhaps some other unknown intervention is best. Needless to say it would be a mistake to invest most of our resources on a cause that further research would reveal to be misguided. This highlights the need to better understand how our actions eat the probability of a future moral catastrophe. So perhaps the most important thing to do is to gear out what to do. We need an open-ended research program on how to best reduce S risks. Drawing on a variety of disciplines ranging from computer science to the social sciences, a top priority is to ND out which S risks are most likely most trackable, most neglected, or of the greatest magnitude. 
This information will in turn feed into an analysis of the best practical ways to mitigate S risks. After all, the end goal is to make adherence in the real world. So it is vital that we bridge the gap between abstract philosophical ideas and concrete interventions. That said, research is not a silver bullet. In light of the complexity of the question of how to best reduce S risks, it can be hard to make substantial progress. And the challenge is compounded by the fact that researchers need to take strange future scenarios seriously while not getting bogged down in overly speculative ideas. This is a difficult balance to strike. Nevertheless, my tentative conclusion is that learning more about how to best reduce S risks should be one of our top priorities at this point. Research on this question is at an early stage, so we can't probably still any key insights that greatly increase the activeness of yurts to reduce S risks. And even if groundbreaking insights elude us, research and reactions still help us to renew our views and to arrive at more nuanced and balanced conclusions. A strategy that focuses on research or other forms of capacity building may seem highly abstract. Such activities are unlikely to pull on our heartstrings, but considering the potentially astronomical stakes and the counterintuitive nature of S risks, we cannot order to blindly follow our most immediate emotions. We need to think carefully about what is most active. Section, what you can do. Are you interested in getting involved in reducing S risks? A simple RST step is to join the discussion and get in touch with other people who are interested in reducing S risks. Being part of a community enables connections with potential mentors and can boost one's motivation to contribute to the cause. If more people think and write about worst case futures, we will make greater progress on the crucial question of how to best avert S risks. The next step could be to think carefully about what you do in your working life. After all, few decisions are as consequential as our choice of career. If you are interested in dedicating your career to the cause, you could consider applying for a role at an organization that contributes to S-risk reduction. Two research organizations with an explicit S-risk focus are the Center for Reducing Sewering, which I co-founded, and the Center on Long-Term Risk. Many other groups also do valuable work that contributes indirectly to S-risk reduction, even if it is not their primary or explicit goal. For example, the Organization for Prevention of Intense Sewering Opus works to increase concern for sewering, and the work of Animal Ethics and Sentience Institute helps to expand humanity's moral circle to include all sentient beings. Another option is to donate to such organizations and thereby support their important work. Finally, perhaps the most important thing to do is to learn more about S-risks and related subjects. It is crucial that we invest in developing our future skills and abilities. After all, our skills and our level of knowledge largely determine how actively we can improve the world. Acknowledgements. The support of my colleagues at the Center for Reducing Suffering Magnus Finding, Teo Agent Table, and Winston Oswald Drummond, has been crucial in completing this book. Their feedback and comments have helped shape the book for which I am very grateful. Deep thanks go to Magnus Finding in particular, for his encouragement and detailed input throughout the entire writing process. Magnus has probably influenced my views more than anyone else, and it is safe to say that this book would not have existed had it not been for his work. I can't ever thank him enough for his tireless work to reduce suffering. I am also deeply grateful to Oscar Horta Simon Knudsen, Jim Bueller, Jesse Reese, Jamie Harris, Casper Osterhold, David Althaus, Miranda Jong, Annabella Wheatley, Timothy Chan, I'm a Six, Michael St. Jules, Anthony D. Giovanni, Leonard Dunn, and Dario Citroni for reading an early draft and providing useful comments. This feedback has helped to improve the book in many ways. Text-to-speech note. This is the end of the main text. Please reference the PDF for a bibliography.